I could just shout, or I could turn on the mic. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, <laughs> it is uh, uh, not an easy passage to preach, so I shouldn't yell it. I should uh, just speak it. Um, Sometimes in the Bible, like right now in Luke, we've been looking at Jesus teaching through parables that are stories that kind of teach us something about the world we live in and how it relates to the kingdom of God that we also live in. God's doing things among us. And then in the middle of these parables, literally in the middle are tucked these five verses that talk about Pharisees making fun of Jesus and, and trying to justify themselves in the law and the prophets and how they interact with the kingdom of God being preached and then heaven and earth passing away and then divorce and remarriage. And then we're right back into the parables. And there's one commentator that I read who literally skipped these five verses altogether. It's not even in the commentary. And I thought, Doug, you put my name next to these verses and the commentators don't even know what to say about it. So we got a challenging text before us this morning. It's gonna take some work to understand what God is saying in these verses, but we believe that all of scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for his people. And so I'm gonna ask you to buckle in and put on those thinking caps today because I think God's got good stuff for us here. Um, have you ever had an experience where somebody said something that you didn't understand? It happens to me often, actually, um, quite a bit. In fact, just this last week at our staff meeting, um, Doug was talking to all of us and he was, I don't remember what he was talking about. I was not paying close enough attention, but he did say, um, you know, it's just part of the warp and woof of our church. I, I thought to myself, I don't know. I don't know what you were talking about and I don't know what those words mean. Uh, I have no idea how to engage right now. And as I sat there, really, I had two options before me. One, I could pretend I knew what warp and woof meant and try to piece together the meaning from the context to not look like a fool and have to ask, Doug, what are you talking about? Or I could take the humble way and say, I, Doug, I don't know what warp and woof mean. That feels like something that's bent and a dog is barking at it. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. What does that mean? It turns out, there are probably people here that know what it means. It turns out that's a weaving term that now colloquially means the base of a thing, the foundation of a thing. Um, so it's the way the fabric like works together in weaving. Uh, I thought, Doug, you could just say the foundation of our church next time because I can't track with that kind of stuff. So I did ask uh, what it meant and he did tell me um, today as we work through the scripture before us, there's going to be a word that I think we might not understand actually. Um, instead, we might be prone to say, I've heard that word and I think I know what it means. And so I'll just try to piece together meaning from context. But I would challenge you this morning, let's not do that. Instead, let's dig into what God's word says, how God defines the word. The word is justify. In fact, Jesus said the Pharisees are those who justify yourselves. And that's not a good thing. And so um, as we work through the text, I do want to piece together meaning, but I also want to use the Bible to, uh, to understand what God is talking about when he says justify. So let's jump into the passage. Let's work our way through God's word and see what he has for us today. Right before this text that Marie read, uh, Jesus told the parable of the dishonest manager. Doug preached on that last week. It, it, Jesus told about a manager who loved money more than his master, and it ended up costing this manager both his job and his place in the master's house. And Jesus closed his thoughts on this parable saying, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 
Jesus is saying the throne of your heart is not a love seat. There's not enough room for two to sit there. Eventually, you'll be devoted to one and despise the other, or you will love the one and hate the other. And Jesus is pleading with all who hear his voice to assess what master they have chosen to serve and what they love the most deep in their heart. Because you cannot serve, you cannot love, you cannot be devoted to both God and money. And so on the heels of that parable, Jesus speaks directly to the Pharisees. That's our passage today. He began like this. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things and they ridiculed Jesus. So right away, Jesus tells us which camp the Pharisees pitched their tent in. Who did they love and who did they hate? Who were they devoted to and what did they despise? The Pharisees were lovers of money, which meant they were haters and despisers of God. That's what Jesus literally had just said. You cannot serve both God and money. You'll love one, hate the other. If they were those who loved money, it means they hated and despised God. And we see the evidence right here on the page in the passage because Luke wrote that the Pharisees ridiculed Jesus. They mocked him. They made fun of him. This reminds me actually of when I worked over in Omaha. I worked in a building right across the street from the downtown YMCA. And on my team um, where I worked, there was a guy who was in his mid-60s, and I was in my late 20s, and he asked me one day, hey, Eric, do you want to go to the Y over the lunch hour and play racquetball to get a little exercise in? And I got a big smile on my face because I was like, you know what, Dan? I can assess this situation. You're an old guy and I'm a young guy. When we walk into this building and the elevator is taking a long time, I jog up the stairs, you stand and wait, right? There's some differences between us. I took a racquetball class in college because I was a slacker and needed a 12th credit and it sounded fun, right? I took a racquetball class in college. I knew what I was doing. Dan was so old. I was like, I don't know if you know what you're doing. And so he asked me, I'm sorry, 65 is not that old. Um, (laughs) But at the time when I was in my late 20s, it sure felt like it was really old. And so I assessed the situation and I'm like, you know what, Dan? Yeah, we'll go play racquetball. I would love to get some exercise in. But as my cocky self assessed the situation, I started uh, responding to Dan. I was like, yeah, let's go get some exercise, man. But on our way in, we better make sure we look for the AED in case you overdo it. I think the YMCA has walkers available if you're sore and need some help walking back to the office afterwards. I started mocking him for asking me if I wanted to get some exercise in. Don't judge me. Y'all looking at me, all right? We've all sinned before. And so, you know, it's not my shining moment, but we go to the YMCA. Dan's like, yeah, 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 okay. So we go to the YMCA and you know what happened on that racquetball court? He slaughtered me, (laughs) totally obliterated me. In fact, somehow that man stood in the center of the court and he hit that ball wherever I was not. If I played to the left, he would hit it to the right. If I played up front, he would hit it to the back court and I ran and ran and ran and ran. And he never took more than a step out of the center (laughs) position and I, Uh, And by the end of that game, he had not even broken a sweat. He beat me three games to nothing. He had not even broken a sweat. I was drenched and sore in places that I didn't know I could be sore. And I was the one wishing I'd driven across the street because I didn't know if I was gonna make it back to the office. I waited for the elevator (laughs) when I got back. My assessment of the situation had blinded me 
to reality. I sized up Dan and I was convinced I knew what was gonna happen. So convinced that him thinking anything else meant I just ridiculed him. And friends, I think this is what's happening with the Pharisees. They thought they had so much to teach Jesus, they never dreamed that Jesus might have something to teach them. Their love of money had so blinded them that they could not see Jesus for who he was, God's long-promised Savior, come to set them free from the chains of sin that they were entangled in. And so in their blindness, they ridiculed God's Son. They just mocked Jesus. And I want to pause for a minute and just ask the question, is that you? For whatever reason, maybe you've written Jesus off and thought to yourself, yeah, he made a name for himself a couple thousand years ago, but he has nothing to do with my life today. Or maybe you've thought, Jesus taught some good things, but it is lunacy to think he is God. Friend, if you have written Jesus off or dismissed his teachings, ridiculed his power, or simply ignored him altogether, can I ask you today to reconsider your position? We've gathered here today to look at the word of God. Would you consider it with an open heart? Eternity is on the line, and he wants you in heaven with him. Okay. Back to Luke, back to our passage. The Pharisees are ridiculing Jesus, and I think he responds to them with three truths about God. Here they are. God knows your heart. God's heart is different than your heart and mine, and God's heart for you does not change. Three truths about God. He knows your heart. His heart is not like your heart, and his heart for you does not change. Let's dive into the first one. God knows your heart. Here's how Jesus said it. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. Did you catch the word that I said? We need to understand, to understand this passage. It's right there. You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. Jesus' response to the Pharisees' mocking words is a contrast. The Pharisees are concerned about what they look on the outside, uh, look like on the outside. They're trying to to look good before men. And mankind, men and women, we can only see the outside of each other. And so they're concerned about how they look on the outside, but Jesus says God does not look on the outside alone. He sees your hearts. He sees what's on the inside. And in the midst of this contrast, Jesus accuses the Pharisees of being those who seek to justify themselves. There's our word, the one that we may not fully understand. It's critical that we get it if we're gonna understand what these verses say. When Jesus uses the word justify, he's not talking about where the text lines up, right, center or left on the document that you're writing, all right? He is instead, justify in the Bible means to declare righteous. It almost has a courtroom type feel where somebody has presented evidence or uh, prepared an exhibit or made a case for consideration. And then the jury looks at the, the evidence and the exhibit and they consider the case that has been made and they make a determination. And to justify means having considered the evidence before me, I am declaring that the thing I considered is right or good or upright or free from sin. To justify is to declare righteous. Now, I don't just want you to take my word for it. Let me show you from the Gospel of Luke how justification works. The first one is back in chapter 10, 
A lawyer asked Jesus, hey Jesus, what is necessary to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds with a question, uh, what do you think? And the lawyer responds saying, well, you gotta love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and you gotta love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you're right. And after that little exchange, this is what Luke says. But he, that lawyer who's asking Jesus questions, but he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? This lawyer is described just like the Pharisees. He wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who exactly is my neighbor? He's trying to sort out from Jesus what's required to inherit eternal life. And when he gets the answer, I gotta love God and I gotta love my neighbor, he says, I wanna prepare the evidence. I wanna make an exhibit. I wanna build a case that I have checked all the boxes required for me to inherit eternal life. I want there to be no confusion, no wondering if I have or haven't met the requirements. I wanna build the case. So Jesus, who exactly do I need to love? And by contrast, he's asking, who do I not need to love? Where, to whom do I have to pour out my heart, give up my life so that I can get eternal life? And who do you not care about, Jesus? If I don't love that person and the box doesn't get checked, I still get eternal life. Where are the categories? He's trying to justify himself by building a case so that he can declare his own righteousness. I loved God and I loved the right people. You see what he's doing? That's justification. There's another spot in Luke that helps us understand this concept. It's, it's a totally different context. Back in chapter seven, John the baptizer had sent some of his followers to ask Jesus some questions about, is he really God's promised savior? Jesus, are you really the long promised Messiah? And Jesus explained that there was evidence that he was God's Messiah because he was doing exactly what the Old Testament said the Messiah would do. He presented evidence for their consideration and then the Bible says, when all the people had heard this and the tax collectors too, they declared God just. That little phrase at the end, declared God just, that's the same Greek word for justify. But the translators didn't say the people justified God because that sounds to our ears like the people did something on behalf of God. They did something for God and that's not the case. Instead, Jesus had made a case. He had given evidence. The prophet Isaiah said the Messiah would do this and I'm doing all those things. Do you see the evidence? And the people considered the evidence before them and they declared, God is righteous. He is good. He is a keeper of his promises. They declared God just. So justification is being declared righteous. And here at the beginning of our passage, Jesus says that the Pharisees are those who justify yourselves before men. They're the kind of people that want to tell everybody just how righteous they think they are by presenting all kinds of evidence that can be seen on the outside. Evidence like the things that they ate and drank and the things that they did not eat and drink. By the people that they would speak to and sit next to and the people that they would not speak to or associate with. All sorts of external things. You get the idea. But Jesus contrasts what they use as evidence to justify themselves with what God himself sees and the evidence he considers when he considers our lives. Jesus said, God knows your hearts. God doesn't only look at what's on the outside. God knows what's on the inside. And when I think about this, I think about like the wife who complains that her husband never says I love you. And the husband responds, 
Well, I told you I did on our wedding day. Why do you keep bothering me about it, right? Uh, in that case, that husband is saying, I already checked the box. I did what I was supposed to do. He considers him, he uses one time long ago evidence as reason to justify his love for his wife. But anybody who hears that argument knows it's empty because only saying I love you once decades ago is not what love is. Love is a matter of the heart that's expressed day by day in word and deed. The Pharisees wanted to check all the right boxes so that people could see what they had done on the outside, but God says he is looking inside their hearts. The first thing that Jesus tells us about God in this passage is that he knows your heart. The second thing he shows us is that God's heart is not like God our hearts. It's not like yours and mine. Here's the way Jesus said it. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. What's exalted among men, an abomination in the sight of God. This is another contrast. Jesus is saying that there are things that people consider valuable and worthwhile and right and good that God calls an abomination. That word abomination means foul or detestable or idolatrous. There's a proverb in the Old Testament that uses these same words, justify and abomination, to help us understand what Jesus is saying. Um, The proverb goes like this. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. So if we're asking, what are the things that we exalt that God finds an abomination? The Proverbs says there are two. First, when a person justifies the wicked. In other words, when we look at the evidence of the world around us, we consider a case, we size up an exhibit, and we see something evil and call it righteous, good, upright, holy, that is an abomination to God when we justify the wicked. The second thing is when a person condemns the righteous, when we consider good and righteous and holy things and then declare them evil, that is an abomination to God. So justifying the uh, wicked and condemning the righteous are both an abomination. And isn't that exactly the two things the Pharisees are doing here before Jesus? They were ridiculing Jesus, mocking him, God in the flesh. They are condemning the righteous one. And they're justifying their own wickedness. They're exalting themselves. They are people who loved money more than God. Both things are an abomination. And just so we know what loving money looked like for the Pharisees, we have a real life example. It's just not in Luke. Luke kind of gives us these concise pictures in these few verses, but the whole council of scripture shows us more. Back in Matthew chapter 15, we see it real clearly. The Pharisees asked Jesus why his disciples didn't wash their hands correctly following Pharisee tradition. And Jesus says, yeah, you guys are real concerned about the outside, but why are you rejecting God's word? Why have you internally not cared about what God had said? Jesus said it like this, for God commanded, honor your father and mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. So God's word, honor mom and pop, all right? But you Pharisees say, if anyone tells his father or mother, what you would have gained from me is already given to God, then he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you've made void the word of God, you hypocrites. 
So what's actually happening here is the Pharisees would accumulate some wealth for themselves, and then they would tell their parents, hey, all that I have is already committed to God. It's devoted to the Lord, which meant, it sounds pious on the outside, doesn't it? Like all that I have is God's. But functionally what that meant for them was they could spend as much money as they wanted on themselves, but not a penny on anybody else, even their struggling, ailing, elderly parents. And so selfishness, their tradition of setting aside all their wealth for God actually made void God's command to them. They loved money more than God. It was an abomination. And friends, I think if we're not careful, we can do the same sort of drifting. We can drift when we assume that God loves the things that we love. It's easy for our hearts to drift and start valuing things that God himself does not value. For example, maybe you start going to the gym just to get healthy. And then after you're there a little while, your goal drifts and you begin valuing body image more than being an image bearer of God. See, it starts good and then just drifts. Maybe you start saving for a reasonable retirement. I just want to be prudent. I want to be wise with my money. And so I'm going to put a little away so that I have some later on. But then you see that account grow and your goals change. And eventually you find yourself desiring wealth for yourself rather than being generous toward others with what God has given you. It starts good and right. And then it drifts into something that God didn't desire for us. Friends, I'm not trying to condemn or make anybody feel guilty. I'm just trying to honestly consider what Jesus wanted the Pharisees to consider. Do we exalt things that God does not exalt? If so, what are those things? How do we try to justify ourselves? God's heart is not like ours. It does not drift and it is not swayed. And actually, that is really good news for us. And Jesus tells us why as the passage goes on. Number three, God's heart for you does not change. The third thing Jesus tells us about God, his heart for you and me does not change. In other words, his plan to save sinners through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, has always been his plan. It is now his plan. It will forever be his plan. God's heart for people lost in sin has not ever changed and will not ever change. He sent his son Jesus to save people like you and me. His heart for you does not change. Here's how Jesus said it. The law and the prophets were until John Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. There's a lot in those few verses. I think Jesus' line of thought goes like this. God's plan hasn't changed and it never will. Okay, simple. First, God's heart for you doesn't change because God's plan hasn't changed. Jesus said the law and the prophets were until John and since then the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. It's like a timeline that he's giving. A salvation, a a history of salvation summary right here in one verse. What's Jesus talking about? Well, the law and the prophets is a way that um, in the New Testament people would summarize or refer to what we know as the Old Testament the written record of all that God has already done for his people and the promises that he would fulfill for his people in the future. So all of God's promises that were made, some fulfilled, all hoped for and expected in the future until John. That's the law and the prophets. John is a reference to John the baptizer, who was the last man who stood in the line of the Old Testament prophets, okay? And then Jesus says something happened after John. The good news of the kingdom of God is preached. So what happened? Jesus started his public ministry after John. That's what changed. 
And so then we have to ask, what's different about Jesus than all of the Old Testament prophets? Well, Jesus doesn't simply declare the promises of God. He fulfills the promises of God. Jesus doesn't just point forward to what God will do. Jesus is God at work. He is what God is doing. He's the one that all of God's promises were about. In fact, the Bible later tells us all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. And that is why it's through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Friends, to boil it all down, God's plan didn't change with Jesus. His plan all along was Jesus. Do you see the difference? It's not like God hit time out on the Old Testament ways to hit time in on Jesus' new way of grace. No, instead, God always promised to give grace through Jesus, his son. And so God's plan hasn't ever changed. His heart for you hasn't ever changed, and it never will. Jesus said it this way. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. The whole of creation, earth and sky and all that fills them, it would be easier for it all to go away than for God to forget one dot of an I or even a lowercase j in his law, right? Not one mark will be forgotten or left unfulfilled as long as there is heaven and earth. It will not change. God's plan in his law, prophesied by his prophets, fulfilled in Jesus, will always be his plan. Jesus even said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And here's what that practically means for us. It means there are parts of the law that we do not practice anymore. If you're sitting there thinking, well, if the law's not done, how come you don't have sheep and goats being slaughtered on an altar up here every Sunday, right? When Jesus fulfilled the law, there are parts that he fulfilled for us once and for all and forever. Um, one of those is the sacrificial laws. So Jesus hung his body on the cross, a perfect man in place of sinful men, as the once and for all and forever sacrifice for the sin of all who believe. So we don't need sheep and goats and doves and pigeons to die for our sin anymore because Jesus died for our sin and his sacrifice was enough to cover all the sins of all people for all time, for all who believe. We're done with sacrificial laws because Jesus fulfilled it. In the same way, he fulfilled the ceremonial laws for cleanness. We don't have to follow those anymore because Jesus' blood cleanses us from sin and makes us clean. So you can eat a pork chop while wearing a poly cotton blend and feel okay about it, all right? <laughs> ceremonial laws, Jesus fulfilled them. But there's another part of the law that though Jesus fulfilled, he now empowers us to go on fulfilling. That's God's moral law. Jesus both fulfilled that himself. The Bible says he never sinned. He was a perfect human, sinless, spotless, stainless. He fulfilled all of God's moral law. And he now sends his spirit to indwell in the believer so that we can follow it too. In Mark, Jesus summarized the whole law in two parts. Love God and love your neighbor. The book of Romans summarizes God's moral law like this. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment. All of the rest of God's moral law are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Therefore, the law has not passed away or become void because of Jesus. Can we just know that? 
We're not serving a different God. We're not working according to a different plan. Jesus has always been and will always be God's plan. The law was fulfilled in him. So we don't abandon God's law because of Jesus. We praise Jesus because he fulfilled the law for us and he empowers us to go on living lives that honor God by the law. To show us what that looks like in real life, Jesus gave an example. And this may be the most uncomfortable part of the passage in the culture that we live in today. He used divorce as an example of the law that continues. Jesus said, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Track with me for a minute, all right? This is where we set down all of our preconceived thoughts and just say, what is God saying through his word here? One, God intended marriage to be a lifelong union between a man and a woman that puts on display the unending, abiding through the best and worst of times, self-sacrificing love of God for his people. Let's say it once more. It's a long sentence. God intended marriage to be a lifelong union between a man and a woman that puts on display the unending, abiding through the best and worst of times, self-sacrificial love of God for his people. And quite simply, divorce is not that kind of picture. So Jesus is saying that the enduring law, including laws against divorce, are a picture of God's enduring love for his people that will not end. That's one thing Jesus is saying. But let me also say that this is not Jesus' only words on divorce, nor is it the only place in scripture that addresses divorce. In this context, Jesus is talking to Pharisees who are wondering if Jesus is canceling out the law. They're wondering if it's okay to divorce their wife for any reason or only for specific reasons. They're trying to justify themselves, saying, if my wife has fallen out of favor with me, how weak is this marriage covenant that I committed to? When can I get out of it? When is that okay? And Jesus is telling them they're asking all the wrong questions. Instead of wondering how weak the marriage covenant is, they ought to be in awe of how strong the covenant love of God is. And that's what marriage points to. So Jesus is concise and pointed here because he's talking to the Pharisees who are trying to get out of marriage here. But in other places in scripture, it's clear that not all marriages are a good picture of God's unending, enduring, self-sacrificing love. And so in scripture, in some cases of adultery and abandonment and abuse, divorce is permitted. And so a wrong response to these strong and pointed words of Jesus on divorce would be to shame or condemn anyone who has experienced divorce. Divorce is painful enough the church doesn't need to add pain to it. So we don't condemn divorcees. A right response instead is to put a high value on marriage as a picture of God's never-changing, never-ending love. A right response would be for the spouses in the room who are married to consider for yourself, am I doing my part to put on display the unending, through the best and worst of times, self-sacrificing, giving up my own good for the good of my spouse, kind of never-ending love that God shows to his people? Am I doing that? And frankly, if you're not, talk to somebody about how to start. You can change. So we don't condemn people who've experienced divorce, but we also don't use divorce like the Pharisees did as a simple way out of a covenant that's supposed to put on display the unending love of God. And so one, we don't condemn. Two, we do value marriage. And three, a right response to Jesus' words here is to be amazed at God's love for us. A heart of love that doesn't change through thick and thin. A heart of love that can look at sinners and say, you have rebelled against and rejected me, yet 
I love you. You have stolen from me, yet I gave my son who gave his very life blood for you. Unending, never changing, self-sacrificing love of God. Oh, be in awe of the God who loves even sinners like us. Friends, I'll close with this. In the middle of all these words, Jesus says, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. When all the promises of God found their yes and amen in Jesus and he was preaching a gospel of grace and life forever, everyone who heard is forcing their way in. That, that phrase, forcing their way into it, could be translated, everyone is forcefully urged to enter into it. And so this morning, can I urge you, oh friend, enter the kingdom of God. He knows your heart and all the way that sin, sin has made it sick and all the ways that the world has made it broken and all the ways that you long to be justified, even making efforts to justify yourself. But friend, the good news today is it's actually the heart of God that we all long for. The one that is unstained and unbroken and free and able to justify you. Able to consider the evidence of your life, seeing even the deepest parts of your heart, the deepest darkness, the sins that you have never shared with anybody, the stains that you have scrubbed and have never come out, the embarrassment of guilt and shame that you think if God ever saw that, there's no way he could love somebody like me. Because of the sacrifice of his son, and the blood of Jesus that can cleanse all sin, God can look on you and justify any sinner, anyone. And so friend, this morning, can I forcefully urge you, use all the force that you have to say yes to Jesus this morning because there is no kingdom like his kingdom. There's no other place where you will find a heart so for you, never giving up on you, urging you into glory and giving you it forever. Don't wait another day. Don't spend another moment trying to justify yourself. Jesus holds the keys to the kingdom of God and he has opened the gates for all who believe in him. So let's respond this morning with belief. Let's pray and then we'll praise together. Friends, will you pray with me? Awesome God, thank you for your word. Even the difficult and challenging and awkward and uncertain parts like this one right in the middle of the parables. Oh God, thank you for seeing our hearts. Friend, I don't know about you, but if you're anything like me, there's sometimes I try to hide it. I try to put on a show and look better than I really am. I get scared about what it would look like if somebody truly saw the depths of my heart. And so can I, can I just invite you today, based on the word of Jesus Christ, to let go of any facade, any mask, any pretense, and know the truth that God sees your heart. And then to know that his heart is not like yours. All the parts that you wish were not in your heart, all the darkness, all the sin that clings, all the stains that stink and reek, all the things that you want to hide, none of that is in the heart of God. He never drifts. He isn't swayed. He doesn't change. He is righteous and holy and good always and forever. He is what we want. And friend, this morning, in spite of that juxtaposition, our dirty hearts next to God's clean heart, he has made a way, not just for us to see him as an example of what we could have been if we hadn't messed up, but he's made a way so that our hearts can be cleansed and clean like his forever. We don't have to justify ourselves and hide the things that we don't want on exhibit we don't want evidence against us. Jesus' blood wipes it clean. He literally removes the stains. It's not like erasing the blackboard so that you can start over. 
It's Jesus taking you to his blackboard and saying, my evidence will stand for you. My righteousness will be in you. And so God, today, as we sit here under your word, would you free us from any notion that we have to justify ourselves? And instead, God, would you open the eyes of our hearts to see the glory that you, a righteous and holy God, have made a way for sinners to know your righteousness and holiness. Friend, if you, if you know that, praise God this morning. Like praise him. I'm saying in a few moments, we're gonna stand and sing. Sing out, let your heart free to worship the God who's saved. And if you don't know that this morning, then I'm telling you today, I wanna forcefully urge you to enter the kingdom of God. Don't wait another day. Don't make another excuse this morning. Bow your knee, rend your heart. That just means open up to God and let him know, God, I've tried to justify myself. And I know if I were the jury looking at me, I would say guilty because I am. I need Jesus. Friend, if you can say yes to Jesus today, you will be justified. You will be declared righteous. He has promised it and not one dot is gonna fade or fail from God's promises. And so today, say yes to Jesus. Jesus, my heart is yours, my life is yours, my sin on your shoulders, your righteousness on mine. I want it now, I want it forever. You've got the keys to the kingdom. I'm gonna walk through the gates. Friend, if you can pray that, welcome home. Welcome in. Jesus says yes to you. God, thank you for loving us, for making a way for us. Would you get all the glory from us today in all of our days? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, we're going to take communion and remember what Jesus